let me throw this out as a general question. What interesting things did you learn or discover from trying to create your perch and jam charts from your requirements? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. Um, when I was making our perch chart, I was like, wait, there's something that needs to be on here that isn't on here. And we didn't discuss how long it's going to take or who's going to do it. <laughs> so I'm going, to have to, I'm going to have to update it a little bit. Yes, and like your requirements, your PERT and chart should be updated on a regular basis. Yes. The different team members have different ideas what the project was. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's more significant than you may think. Because even with requirements, it's kind of like everyone says, yeah, yeah. And everyone has in their own mind what they think the requirements mean. And then when you try to break it down into tasks, you're going to do X. And someone's saying, well, wait, I, I wasn't going to do that. Do we have to do that? I thought this was going to be this. Yes? How interdependent all the tasks are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially on a short-term project like this. They are very interdependent. Any other? Any other insights or revelations as you're putting these together? Yes? Uh, looking at when the first demo was, how much crunch time we had. <laughs> That's much sooner than you thought, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the first, first demo was... Let me, <coughs> let me give you a uh, technique I learned the hard way that's useful when you're trying to put together particularly an initial schedule. It's to start with the finished product, start with the end thing, the demo or whatever, and say, what do I have to do just before the demo's ready? And list all those tasks. This is what has and then for each of those, say, what has to be done for each of those? If you start with the end in mind and work backwards, you'll actually have a much better estimation of the tasks. Which you'll discover very quickly is what some of you have already pointed out. There's a lot more that needs to be done than you thought there was. <coughs> and the problem with most scheduling is that you tend to, I'm going to use my own pens because I think they work better than these. You tend to say, here's our start, and we have a task, and we have a task, and we have a task. And this has a task, and this may have two more tasks, and this may have a task, and this has a task, and that depends on that, and that goes down to another task, and this goes down to a task, which goes up here, and goes here to a task. And what you start doing is, and then here you have, like, here's our ship. And mentally, you do the same thing we've talked about, which is you defer all the hard stuff without realizing it. This, is, this becomes the equivalent. There's a classic uh, cartoon by Sidney Harris. Shows two scientists in front of a chalkboard filled with the equations uh, leading to, to some conclusion. And right in the middle of this chain of equations, there's handwritten a note. Here, a miracle occurs. <laughs> and what scientist is saying to the one who obviously wrote it, I think you need to be more specific here. Okay? That is so common in software. You, you sort of see all this, and you think, okay, and, and this is all magically going to go together, and their pieces are all going to fit, and we won't have overlooked anything, and we're not going to have massive expansion of requirements. Uh, and this is why you get the the 90-90 rule. You look at this and say, oh, we're 90% done when we get to here, and you've actually got, like, you know, this more to ship. Uh, so, yes, the, the, again, part of this exercise is you, you real, suddenly realize there are things you didn't have in your requirements, and that your requirements are expanding in ways you didn't anticipate. Any other any other thoughts and comments? Of course, and you're doing all this and you don't have an architecture yet. <laughs> Which may change some other things. Uh, <coughs> this may be the second most important concept in mythical landmark. Is the need for conceptual unity. 
And that usually means a need for a chief architect, or at the very least, an architecture team. Without that conceptual unity, you have exactly the problem someone described here. You have people who thought, oh, this is, had completely different ideas <coughs> as to how aspects of the program are going to work. <coughs> you need to have someone whose job it is to ensure <coughs> that there is conceptual integrity and unity within the software and to basically answer those questions. Make the call. Just as project manager makes a hard call on features and schedule, the software architect makes a hard call on design and implementation. It says this will work, this won't work. Uh, <clears throat> I was at Pages for five years. I was the chief software architect. Uh, I came up with what, in my opinion, was actually a very good architecture. Uh, and I'll talk some about that as we go along, but. But a lot of my job was educating the rest of the development team. These were, these were, these were all bright, experienced developers. These are not people who, who I needed to tutor or whose hands I needed to held, hold. But what I needed to do was get them each to understand the architecture I had come up with. And to make sure that their coding and implementation was consistent with that architecture. Part of what I did, and of course this is almost 30 years ago, 1990, had a large, I love graph paper. I discovered graph paper in my freshman year of college. I've loved it ever since. Had a large pad of graph paper. And when I was working on this largely on my own, I started sketching out architecture, I did, and I did basically three things. I did a component diagram. I did three diagrams, all in colored, all with colored pens on large graph paper. One was sort of, here are the major components of the software. Here's who talks to what. Here's how information gets passed along. You know, here is the display. So I basically laid out the component architecture in terms of the, the systems and subsystems of it. The second thing I did, this was a design-oriented, object-oriented document processing system. So I had to actually come up with the class component, not hierarchy, but the class component diagram of what constituted a document. So I had a document with, you know, some number of components, and these did this, and these did that, and basically defined what a document would look like in terms of uh, a composition of a set of objects. And then, this is 1990, object-oriented development, I did a class hierarchy diagram. But <clears throat> I did it, I had a fundamental approach, and part of what I did is that, I think I still have these in my file somewhere. If I, if I can dig them up, I will bring them up. I had these parallel hierarchies that dealt with related objects that followed the same inheritance structure. I fit each of these on a single large sheet of graph paper. I would draw them over and over again until I was happy with them and finally got a finished version of each of the three, signed and dated it went down to Kinko's, got large color copies. And each time I hired a new developer, I gave her or him copies of those three diagrams. Sat down and said, this is what we're building. This is how it works. And they did a great job. I didn't do all the invention. I didn't do all the work. What I did is I said, Here, here's the sandbox you're playing in. Here are the rules. This is how things fit. 
Now, I spent a lot of time doing this. Fortunately, I had a lot of time because we were still trying to raise money. So basically, it took us a year and a half to raise funds. So I spent a year and a half working on and refining and improving the architecture while, while putting together very, very dirty, ugly, underneath demos to demonstrate our concepts on an actual working computer screen uh, and to try and get investors. And we shipped, that was, we, we closed on funding at the end of 91, start of 92. We shipped uh, in March of 94. Late summer of 94, we had someone at Next say, there's this thing that's come out of CERN called the web. I said, why don't you look at it and see, see how well your stuff works with it. Now, early on <coughs> in, this, in my research in this architecture, I looked very closely at standard generalized markup language, HTML. So I started looking at, at all the HTML stuff. I actually participated in the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force definition on HTML because we were doing tables. And I was, I was in there talking about, okay, here are the things that you have to think about if you're trying to mark up tables. Here are some of the issues. Anyway. So, <clears throat> we did a, a 1.0 release. We did like a 1.5 in the fall. And then in four months' time, we turned it into a drag and drop web page editor. Version <coughs> 1.7. From start to release, four months, because the internal structure was all there, the architecture lent, <coughs> lent itself extremely well to it. You would actually lay out web pages, pulling stuff off a pallet. And then you click a button, and it would emit the HTML files. You did not have to touch HTML. This was in January of 1995. Uh, we showed it off at the Web World Conference in Orlando. It had crowds around our booth. But there was one problem. We were running on Next Step. And Next Step was a, a at that point, a dead-end platform. Uh, and so we tried to raise funds to get it on Windows. And the venture capitalists all basically said, what's this web stuff? Microsoft's just going to own all that, aren't they? And no one wanted to fund it all. So we ran out of money. We basically saturated our next step market, ran out of money before we could port anything on Windows, closed the doors. Four of the engineers went on and did a startup that did about 10 to 20 percent of what we had working with web pages. And in two years' time, sold themselves to Netscape for $24 million. Yes. <laughs> Good for them. They invited me, by the way. They, they said, come on, come on. I said, no, I, this, is, this is my last startup. I've already done it. <laughs> so <coughs> the point of all this is that architecture matters thought about architecture matters. I've already talked about with pages. I asked Vic Spindler, one of the two founders, graphic designer, I said, come up with a design model that's just bizarre and off the wall. And he came up with April, named after a designer, April Brighton. And it had round headlines, and text had to curve around stuff, and basically broke everything we've been doing up to that point. <coughs> but it made me rethink the architecture so that it could encompass not just the very plain vanilla and standard design models we had, but this bizarre one off to one side. And that made our architecture far more flexible and robust. It allowed us to do multiple updates on a very quick time frame. Uh, <clears throat> what it didn't do was guarantee success in the marketplace. Anyway. Now, Accelerate also talks about the importance of architecture. <coughs> and this was, someone brought this up as a question talking about uh, Brooks Law, I think it was last week. Is there a way in which adding people can actually work? And according to Accelerate, yes. What you want is a loosely coupled architecture. You want components. I mean, and, and none of, I mean, there's, there's nothing terrible in the original 
But you want to architect it so that you've got oh, the green is big. That's why you're using your markers. Oh, I picked up theirs. Thank you. My green is still in the bag. What you want, as far as possible, uh, to decompose the architecture into loosely coupled components, each with a relatively stable API. I mean, this, this is classic information hiding. This is this is object development 101 in no sense. But it often is not applied on an architectural basis. Often on an architectural basis, the inclination is to mash everything together. Sometimes for performance reasons. Uh, sometimes because you don't have someone separating these. But the idea is that I can do whatever I want inside here. As long as my API stays stable, it doesn't matter to everyone else. So if I have a new set of features I want to add, I define a new module with a stable API, and then I pour people into there and get them to do that. This is a lot of the impetus behind service-oriented architectures uh, with the idea of, of trying to just have a standard interface and be able to do changes behind it. Uh, They have a list of why you can read that. You've got the slide. I'm not going to read it to you. You've got the book. You're supposed to be reading. You're supposed to have read it by now. Anyway, but the idea, again, is to, and by the way, with Conway's Law, that means your organization needs to be set up so that you've got separate groups for each of these. They're all working on the inside. Someone manages the API, keeps it stable. Uh, I think I've already raised, I'll, I'll just say it as a point, I, I think I've raised the concept of a DB API as, as well. A standard API says, here's the function name, here's the parameters. Deep API says, and here's the order in which you have to call these. <laughs> uh, you have to call this, this procedure first, and then any one of these three, and then you have to call this one every second. And then you call this one to wrap it up. That's the deep API. And often, you'll get API documentation that only has the, sh the shallow one. Here's a list of procedures. So like, OK, what the hell do I do with this? I mean, how, how many of you have, have done that? You've gone into a language or library, and it's kind of like, OK, I need to look at your containers. And here's a list of procedures. Like, oh, great. Now what do I do? <laughs> and what do you do? Stack Overflow. <laughs> How do I build a container? Oh, that's the order I want. And you get that, get that running site. Okay, now I'm going to change things and see what works. There's a hand over here somewhere. Yes? Just kind of a curiosity question. About <coughs> how large, is there like a rule that you have learned in your career about how large maybe a module like this should be? Oh, gosh. Uh, right, because if, if you start getting it's so too big. It's it's, yeah, it's the get, same problem. Yeah. If you get too big, then it becomes the same problem where all of them interdepend on each other, and you can cause problems if you change one of them. And so I'm just wondering, kind of. There is there is a famous magic number that you may recall. This comes from research 60, 70 years ago at Bell Labs, trying <laughs> to figure out the phone system for the United States. And the question was, what can people remember? How many numbers? And the answer was 7 plus or minus 2. If you Google 7 plus or minus 2, you'll see lots and lots of hits on that. There's, there's, there's sort of a conceptual level there. So that actually shows up in a lot of other things. In terms of internal <coughs> communication, I would say 7 plus or minus 2 is probably an ideal team size. Uh, once you get more than that, then you start to have the communication issues within the team start to break down. Uh, and so that's, if, if I had to give an answer, that's it. I have no uh, empirical proof for that. But I have, I have enough programming experience seeing what teams work well and what teams work well. We had, at Pages, we had eight 
honest business developers and two associated engineers <coughs> who were doing some specialized work. Uh, it would have been hard to work with a team bigger than that. That's probably pushing the limit. Yeah. I think it's Amazon that has the two pizza rule that no team should be large enough that two pizzas can't feed them. Yeah, but well, that's a problem with me. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> but no, no, I, that, so that, 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 no, no, that is that is an excellent rule. Mm. Uh, if you don't want you don't want big teams, you want small teams, and that's if you take this overall approach architecturally, that allows you to create small teams that can work. You know. As a team, as a tight team. I mean, frankly, the ideal team size for software is about three or four people. But then, if the task is big enough, that's just not enough. That's something Brooks addressed uh, early on in Mythical Man. And how do you organize it? So, yeah, I, I, I'd say three pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can eat, I can eat an awful lot of pizza. Yeah. True story. True startup story. <laughs> Stop me if I've already mentioned this. Early days, pages. I, I, the, the two founders are on the East Coast. I'm on the West Coast in San Diego. I go out and find office space. Uh, I hire an office manager. I have two developers. Uh, one is my sister, who's, who's an outstanding software engineer and architect. The other is Bruce Henderson, who I've just met. And he's, he's actually probably my best friend outside of my wife 30 years later. But I've hired both of them. We're in these offices. We've got desks with computers. It's, it's not closed up offices because this is very early days. Debbie Haygood, who just hired her as our office manager. Uh, wonderful woman. Love her dearly. Uh, still friends with her on Facebook. We ended up calling her our den mother uh, for the engineering team. But this is, she's only been working here like a week or so. Bruce and Deirdre and I are there late one night talking things up. We have one wall that's all whiteboard. So we're writing stuff on the wall and talking through stuff and so on. And we get some pizzas from a local hole on the wall that have great, great thick, juicy, greasy pieces. But there's about two thirds of the pizza left. And right now in these offices, all we have is one of those little tiny fridges. <coughs> so I just set the pizza box on top of the fridge. Because hey, pizza, pizza lasts for like just fine. Next morning, I come in, I've skipped breakfast, because I know there's pizza there. <laughs> I come in and look and look at the fridge and look around that room and can't see it. And I finally, I noticed Debbie's in. I said, Debbie, there is some pizza back here. Do you know where it is? She says, oh yeah, it sat out all night and I threw it out. I said, Debbie! <laughs> she says, what? It will go bad. I said, no, pizza doesn't go bad overnight. I was planning to eat that for breakfast. <laughs> so I go grumpily off to my desk and start doing whatever I was doing. Fifteen minutes later, Bruce Henderson comes in, walks back to where the bridge is, <laughs> and says, Debbie, have you seen the pizza here? <laughs> she says, fine, that's it. I'm never throwing anything away again. Look at food poisoning for all I care. <laughs> Pizza is truly the breakfast of champions. Okay, <laughs> moving right along here. Foreign architecture, Conway's law organization should reflect this. You want, uh, as mentioned, a loosely coupled architecture allows you to scale more safely. <clears throat> One of the things that that uh, Forrest Brand and all say in architecture is the teams here should be allowed to choose their tools within reason. I mean, obviously things have to be compatible with each other. But that said, let them experiment with tools. Have any of you, and I, I realize Things are quite different money-wise nowadays for, for computers, and for that matter, for software tools than they were 30, 40 years ago. But have any of you run into the problem where you're doing work as an intern or employee and the company just doesn't want to spend time or spend money on better hardware, faster compilation, better tools? <coughs> yeah, sure. I mean, when I started working on my current job, they gave me a computer with like an Intel Solar on or something. Oh, wow. So I look, the processor was worth less on eBay than one hour of my time. 
Yeah, and eventually I can lose my boss replace them because that was ridiculous. Then you'll still run across this mindset. <coughs> and it's insane. Because of what exactly what you said. Your time and productivity. The, here's the lesson that I was taught. And this was all the way back. I want to say early days at Pages. There's a very thriving tech community there in San Diego. I happened to be talking to someone who had another uh, information technology startup. I was quite successful at it. And he said, I don't set a budget for hardware and software tools to my developers. He says, I let them buy whatever they want whatever top of the line stuff, he says, because here's what I learned. They can't spend enough to equal the amount of money I lose by being one month late in shipping. <laughs> and this is so true. This, I mean, it's <coughs> absolutely insane. It's like they think you're trying to get away with something. Well, you just, you're just here because you want cool, fast hardware. Well, yeah. <laughs> And guess what? Uh, yeah, I'll be here 12 hours programming on it because it's so cool and fast. It's not frustrating. It's like, hey, look how fast that compiles. Look how quickly I can do this. Give me that sweet one terabyte solid state. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hey, I had, I had a, as a personal goal for about 20 years, having one terabyte of storage in a desktop system. <laughs> back, back when, starting back when a terabyte was something that sort of filled a room. And I achieved that sometime in the early 2000s in DC. Petabyte. That's my goal before I die. <laughs> a desktop system with a petabyte of storage in it. I figure it's going to take me about eight to ten years. I just have to hold on that long. No, seriously. About eight to ten years. I should be able to put a petabyte of storage into a desktop system. Just long enough to enjoy it as well. Well, I actually always enjoy it. Oh, that's so cool. That's, that's the advantage of being old in IT, is, is that you just you spend all day saying, yeah, I remember when. You know, I, I remember when I was working on 4K systems. You know, I remember toggling stuff in. Great, great story from when I was an undergrad. One of the instructors in the department uh, was doing research work involving a data general Nova mini computer. And it didn't have any storage on it. He had to key in programs from the front panel using switches. It's like you set the address and you press the button, and then you toggle the data for that address and you press the button. And it was octal. DG was octal. It wasn't hex. It wasn't binary. It was octal. <coughs> so he said, and he's telling us, and he, he was the TA for uh, class I had in operating systems, he said, he says, I finally just got tired of, of the tedium. He said, I spent three or four weeks becoming absolutely proficient in octal arithmetic. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And he said, and I did. He says, I can, I can basically do octal math all day long. He says, it greatly helped in my project, he says, but I've never been able to balance my checkbook since. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> okay, moving on here. Uh, architects should focus on engineers and outcomes, not tools and technologies. Architects often decide, oh, I want to, you know, I think this is the tool we should be doing, or I think this is the methodology we should use, or whatever. The goal as an architect, your goal is to provide a framework for the engineers so that there is consistency in process. What you don't <coughs> want to do is get wrapped up in a particular solution or approach. Indeed, you should probably use your engineers and let them play off of each other to figure out what actually works best for the problems that you're dealing with. Uh, last This article, controlling, this is an idea that struck me, you know, writing monthly columns. So it's like, okay, what am I going to write about this month? Uh, <coughs> we've had a lot of talk, a lot of you have already brought up issues of dealing with other people's code, existing systems, of trying to figure them out. This article 
I basically proposed organizations should designate a maintenance architect. This is someone whose role it is to understand the architecture and implementation of all your legacy systems. Because what you'll find when you go into maintenance is that about two-thirds of the total cost of a software project is spent in maintenance, spent after it goes live. And of that, about two-thirds is adding new features. Only about one-third is fixing bugs. <coughs> and the problem you have is you add new features is that it tends to be done by people who really don't know the architecture. So what do they do? It's kludge time. It's like, okay, if, if, I, if I force this file to have data in this format and block it from calling this subroutine, I can make this work. <laughs> and what you end up with is software rot, software entropy. The software becomes less and less stable and cohesive over time. So my, my modest proposal here was that you should, this is a great training ground. If you have someone who you want to grow <coughs> into becoming a chief architect, have her or him work as a maintenance architect. Analyze the existing systems, understand how they work, oversee requests for changes, or requests for bug fixes, and after a certain period of time, this person will actually understand the systems better than anyone else. And then you can bump them up to chief architect, because they now know what's necessary for any new system to interact with the legacy systems, which is always a nightmare. I do a lot of failed projects. Trust me, tying into legacy systems or replacing legacy systems. Is <coughs> any comments or thoughts based on this? Uh, the longest yard. Hope you're ready. But I spent a lot of time on this. The 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 the. 20,000 foot view is that here's the fundamental problem with management of hiring and management of software teams. It's done in an industrial mindset. It's, it's hiring workers for a factory line. <clears throat> uh, the argument that Ruby and I made is it's more like building a sports team. And having, having built teams from scratch, trust me, it's got all the dynamics <laughs> and all the issues. But it's not how we tend to hire people. It's kind of like HR says, okay, you have to have you know, X years of this and Y years of this and do this and do that. Uh, <clears throat> you usually don't have a body of work to look at. Some people do portfolios, but part of the problem there is you really can't take as a portfolio the last project you're working on a former employer because that's theft of intellectual property. So the question is, how do you focus, and my, my, you all read this, so I'm not going to say a whole lot more other than this is a different mindset. You need to hire for talent, but hire for team ability, train them, coach them. Uh, typically speaking, though, though <laughs> as we've seen, things can work out quite differently. Typically, you don't hire someone and then throw them into a game. <coughs> uh, and actually, that's sort of been one of the challenges BYU's been facing uh, with, the, with the quarterbacks. You give them a chance to come up to speed, to understand things, uh, to have pilot projects to work on. Something I will talk about a lot, <coughs> particularly when adopting any new technology or methodology. You don't use it for the first time on a mission critical project. You do a pilot project. Both to see whether or not it actually works and to train people on using it. Yet time and again, what I see are failed projects where the organization doing the development chose to use a new methodology and or some new, some new technologies, be it a language, operating system tools, and or hired people who've never had any experience with the technology or methodologies, and then put it on a mission critical project. That's a recipe for failure. <laughs> How 
many of you in your projects are using technologies? Find yourself using Alex. Find yourself using technologies that you're not familiar with right now in your projects. And what's the experience? What's how does it feel? It's a learning curve. <laughs> it is. Steep. Very steep learning curve. <clears throat> and you have organizations that will do multi-million dollar projects. And they will use methodologies, technologies, uh, technologies that they've never successfully delivered anything with before. So, that's all I have to say about that. Let me take the role. We'll take an early bathroom break. And then we'll come back and talk about the architecture and design document that you have to do this week. <coughs> uh,